Okay. Um, all right. Uh, welcome to the popular music books and process series. Um, all events this fall are scheduled for Tuesdays at 5 p.m. Um, Eastern time, email Francesca Royster, F. Royster at DePaul.edu to be added to the series email. Um, email list and get Zoom links. And you can watch the video for all our all the presentations on Eric Weisbard's YouTube channel soon after the event happens. And you can find the whole calendar for the series on the IASPUM US website under the journal tab. Okay. Um, the series is co-organized by Kimberly Matt, Francesca Royster, Gus Stadler, Carl Wilson, with me, Antonia Randolph, sitting in for Eric Weisbard this year. Eric will join as often as he can, given the time difference overseas where he is on a fellowship. The, ser the series is sponsored by the Journal of Popular Music Studies, IASPA US, and the Pop Conference. Next week, we will have um, music videos featuring Carol Vernalis and her book, The Media Swirl, Politics, Audio, Visuality, and Aesthetics. And we'll also have Stephen Shaviro um, talking about the rhythm image, music videos, and new audiovisual forms. So that's next week on October 10th. <clears throat> Today we have Ray Padgett and Stephen Hayden in conversation about Bob Dylan. Ray Padgett is the author of Pledging My Time, Conversations with Bob Dylan Band Members, published by EW Press in 2023. Um, and Ray Bad Padgett is a music writer based in Burlington, Vermont. He's the author of Pledging My Time, Conversations with Bob Dylan Band Members, 2023, Cover Me, The Stories Behind the Greatest Cover Songs of All Time, 2017, and in the 33rd, 2033 in the third series, I'm Your Fan, The Songs of Leonard Cohen, 2020. He writes the Substack newsletter, flagging down the double E's about Bob Dylan in concert and is the founder of the cover songs blog, Cover Me. His writing has appeared in The New Yorker, Spin, Vice, and Mojo. And Ray will be in conversation with Stephen Hayden. Stephen Hayden is an author, rock critic, podcaster, and filmmaker. His books include Your Favorite Band is Killing Me, the national, best, the national bestseller, Twilight of the Gods, Hard to Handle, which is with Steve Gorman, This Isn't Happening, Long Road, and the forthcoming There's Nothing You There Was Nothing You Could Do, Bruce Springsteen's Born in the USA and the End of the Heartland. He is the cultural critic at Uprocks. His writing has also appeared in the New York Times Magazine, Washington Post, Billboard, Pitchfork, Rolling Stones, Grantland, The Ringer, The AV Club, Slate, and Salon. He was the consulting producer of the 2021 HBO documentary, Woodstock, Woodstock 99, Peace, Love, and Rage. He currently co-hosts two podcasts, IndieCast about contemporary indie rock and never ending stories about Bob Dylan's never ending tour. He lives in Minneapolis with his wife and two children. A couple technical notes. Place your questions in the chat and Kim will lead the Q&A after uh, the conversation between Ray and Steven. Um, and she will ask you to unmute your mic and ask your questions. So we'll save all questions to the end. You can put your questions and your comments in the chat. Um, and now I will turn it over to Ray and Stephen. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for that intro. I'm very glad that you read my bio before you read Steve's because I would not want to uh, would not want to follow that. That was fairly intimidating. I insisted that my bio be at least two or three sentences longer than yours. Uh, <laughs> so I'm glad that we lived up to that. You know, for some reason, I didn't know that you are in Burlington, Vermont. 
Yeah. Uh, well, we haven't been that long, but we moved shortly before the before the pandemic. Okay. So, yep. can we just talk about fish then? Uh, can we set the Dylan book aside? Can I... Oh, if I start talking about fish around here, I'm going to get kicked out of the city <laughs> for my fish takes. <laughs> okay. Well, anyway, it's great to talk to you about this book. You know, I'm a fan of this book, and I love your Substack. Uh, and uh, I, I was pleased to blurb this book, spread the word about it, and it seems to be doing very well. So you deserve that. That's great. Um, I want to begin by bringing up something that I think you said, or I think I read you write this. And if I'm wrong, tell me. But I, I believe you once talked about how you're more interested in Dylan as a music maker than as a lyricist, that you tend to focus more on the music than the words. And that's such an interesting approach because as we know, most people that write about Dylan focus on him as a writer. I think too much. I mean, I I love Dylan as a lyricist, but I think his music does get short shrift. Can you talk about that? It, that is something you've said, right? I didn't hallucinate. That, that. is correct, yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I know it's a little ridiculous or at least unusual. You know, you think of like the Nobel Prize people and you you know read what they wrote. They act like he never sang a note, right? He just writes stuff on paper. Like, you might as well be writing books. Whereas I, I yeah, I don't, I mean, it sounds ridiculous to say in many cases, I don't really know the lyrics, which is not like, to be clear, I'm not like, oh, Bob Dylan is overrated as a, as a lyricist. I just, my brain with everyone, I, I listen to music more and, you know, it takes me like 10 times listening to a song before I begin to have any inclination of what it of what it's about but in some ways that sort of informed both this book and just everything i've written about about dylan like talking to these people you know these musicians they didn't write the lyrics they for the most part weren't there when he was writing the lyrics um but you know they were there when he was creating the music whether it was the original recording or whether it was a totally different arrangement he did 20 years later because of course he's always changing how his songs go even when he's singing the same lyrics the music will be totally different so that's yeah, that's kind of how I got into Dylan was from the music, from the fact that he's always changing the music, which which makes me certainly unusual. Although I I got to say, there's like a secret society of us that like we have a secret handshake. I sort of will talk to people and someone, you know, will say, yeah, I'm the same way. I actually don't know, think that much about his lyrics either. But, we, we, you know, we're a little underground, but that we are out there. Well, do you think that that's why you've chosen to focus more on him as a live performer? Because, you know, as you just... So, you know, alluded to, you know, if you listen to his bootlegs, there's so much music that's original to his live material. Do you think that that has been like a big part of the attraction for you, like being more attracted to him as a musician than as a lyricist? I think that's right. I mean, I love the albums, obviously, but as you say, the lyrics. 99% of the time, he's singing the same lyrics that he's singing on the album. There are interesting exceptions where he changes them, but mostly sings the same basic lyrics. Whereas the music, you know, he'll do one year, he'll do like a Rolling Stone as like a slow three, four ballad. And then two years later, suddenly it's a fast punk song. And then another few years later, it's, I don't know, a polka or something. Um, and so that, you know, I became a Dylan fan, I guess I would say from, from the albums. My dad had some growing up, but I became like a super fan and got really interested through seeing him live and through collecting the bootlegs just because of how, unlike most artists, almost all artists, particularly outside of the realm of, say, jazz, he always is changing the music, always is changing songs, even if they're 60 years old. Make the case for Dylan as a musician, because, again, like you said, when he wins the Nobel Prize, it is focusing on him as a writer. And like you said, it's almost like he never sang at all. It was just that he wrote these songs on paper, and that's why he's being... Uh, uh, awarded in this fashion. I mean, because if you look at Dylan just on a technical level, he's not a dazzling guitar player. I think he's a great singer, but people certainly disagree on the quality of his singing. Uh, he's not writing like sophisticated melodies necessarily, especially compared to like a Paul McCartney or Joni Mitchell or you know, any of his peers from the 60s and 70s. So all these sort of like I guess on paper type things that people would point to to say this is a great musician aren't necessarily true with Dylan. So like, what is the case that you would make for him being a great musician? I would say it has to do with just the constant creative drive 
the never being satisfied with, okay, this song is done. I'm now going to sing Blowing in the Wind, just like it's 1962 at every show for the next 60 years, which most of his peers would do. You know, you mentioned McCartney. I've seen McCartney. He's a great live show, but he does Blackbird and he plays the Blackbird riff. You know, it sounds the same. Um, but I think, as you say, I could make a case for his guitar playing, but not he's not Hendrix. You know, his singing, as you say, I, I'm my line I use with this singing that is that he's a great singer with a bad voice. But and that sort of ties into what I'm saying about this musical creativity. I've been talking about arrangements, but the same thing goes with the melodies. He will sing a line different every single night. He will emphasize different things. He will bring new meaning to it. Sometimes it'll be transcendent. Sometimes it'll be bad. <laughs> you know, that's what happens when you do it differently every night. Um, but he's not just going to sing it, you know, the same standard way. And for me, as someone who's sort of interested in that sort of change, I just find that that fascinating. And I think that is, as you say, most of the standard things that would make someone a great musician probably don't apply to him. But that creative drive is almost unique in terms of someone of his sort of stature. One of the things that's really unique about Dylan and, and your book attests to this is just the number of musicians he's worked with over the years. I mean, it, it's typical for a lot of older musicians who've been around a while, they, they tend to have backing bands or they have people that have just played in their bands for like a really long time. And and Dylan, meanwhile, has constantly been turning over uh, his bands over the years. You have Tony Garnier being the exception in his current band, but for the most part, he's working with a lot of different people over the years. I'm curious, you know, one thing I always wonder about with Dylan, you know, we talk about the rearrangements of his songs, and that's a big thing that if you care about Dylan as a live performer, that's the exciting thing. You want to hear what he's what the new version of whatever song is going to be from talking with his hello was that just me to be playing with in a particular oh. moment in time uh sorry you cut out for the last little bit there what was the sorry i was i was wondering in terms of his rearrangements how mm -hmm. much does that have to do with Dylan, would you say? And how much of that has to do with him bringing in new people and them having like a different musical flavor? I don't think there's a difference between the two. I mean, it is you're correct that from all these people I talked to, Bob Dylan does not show up at a rehearsal and say, I want Girl from the North Country to sound like this. Here, let me hand you the sheets with all your parts. You know, now it's a fast rockabilly song or something. That's That's not how it works. But he is sort of a curator. He brings in, as you say, all these new people with one or two exceptions. He doesn't seem to work with people for many years at a time. And they'll just get in a room and start playing Girl from the North Country. And they'll sort of play around with it. And just without even really talking about it, Bob will be singing it different ways. They'll be sort of trying to follow his lead. And a new arrangement will emerge and then, of course, they'll get on stage and that arrangement will change more. Maybe Dylan will sing it a totally different way than he sang it in rehearsal. So it's definitely not that he is single handedly coming up with these arrangements, but he is absolutely picking the people and putting them in a situation that is going to lead to this sort of creativity and reinvention. And I think that is very conscious from what I've heard from people. What are the big general I guess, sentiments that you've heard from people over the years. Are there any connective threads from someone like Rob Stoner, who's working with him in the 70s, to Larry Campbell working with him like 30 years later? What are like the big kind of broad things that you find are common in people's experiences working with him? Well, one thing that came up a lot, which sort of relates to what I was just saying, but I found fascinating was person after person across decades compared playing with Bob Dylan to jazz. And the first couple of times I kind of rolled my eyes. It's like, okay, like, come on, he's not Miles Davis. Like he's not literally making jazz music, obviously. Um, but it came up again and again, and it's exactly what we're talking about. You know, these people would say, even if I'm playing the same song on stage with him every single night, I should not be playing it the same way. This one guy, um, I think it was Chris Parker, who was the first drummer of the Never Ending Tour, which is Dylan's very long running tour that started in the 80s. He had this, this interesting story I found fascinating where just the small moment he said, we're playing Knocking on Heaven's Door one night, one night. And that's an acoustic song, no drums. So he's just, you know, standing by the side waiting to come back on. But he's listening and he says, you know, 
this is a big build. I think a drum fill would sound great. So he sort of sneaks back onto the drums and without, you know, telling Bob, it's the middle of the song. He does this big drum fill going into like the final chorus. Dylan turns around, looks at him, gives him, you know, a big smile, something. And I sort of go, oh, so I bet that was the new part. And he says, no, I never did it that way again, because I knew if I'd done it that way a second night or a third night, Dylan would not have been happy. That was a one night only sort of thing. And I think he was one of the people who compared it to jazz, but that sort of story would come up again and again. And do you find that generally people enjoy that aspect? Or have you heard disgruntled complaints about that sort of thing? I mean, the sense I get is that people tend to appreciate that aspect of, of what he does. Generally, yes. Um, most people seemed to appreciate it. I mean, these are sort of in large part like musicians, musician types, studio guys, the people, Jim Keltner or something who like kind of wants to be challenged. Um, but there, I heard from a few disgruntled people too, you know, like there's this guy named Duke Robillard who was Dylan's guitarist. Very well, he played on Time Out of Mind. Good experience, a sort of iconic album. And this is another theme. People tend to come back. So he plays on Time Out of Mind. That's in 1997. 15 years later, he joins Dylan's live band. And he basically is talk, telling me about how Dylan's not giving him any instruction, how he doesn't feel like he knows what Dylan wants. He can just tell that he's making him mad. Dylan's not giving him any feedback except glaring at him on stage. And so, yeah, he and he ends up leaving, you know, halfway through the tour. So I think there it can be an obvious challenge. Most people seemed like they found it fairly invigorating. But uh, you can see the flip side of that coin, which is that that is really tough to reinvent a song every single night, especially if the boss isn't going to give you explicit instructions how to do so. Now, you and I are obviously Dylan fans. We admire what he does. We spend a lot of time thinking about him, writing about him, talking about him. And it's interesting in this conversation so far because, you know, we, we, we've talked about him bringing in musicians and he's not necessarily telling people what to play, but he's almost acting like a film director who's casting actors and like you bring an actor in and you know they're going to bring a quality to your film and you don't have to tell them everything that's the point of casting something well i think that's that's i think a good analogy for what you were describing earlier i'm gonna play devil's advocate here just for a second is it possible that dylan just doesn't know what he wants or, or that he is somehow like just musicians is there any evidence to support that that sometimes these things that he does that are eccentric that are hard to understand that again i i think that are often genius but is it possible that we're wrong and that this guy just doesn't know what he's doing i don't really think those are mutually exclusive i mean on a, on a literal level i think he doesn't know what he wants Again, in the sense of he's bringing in people and they're right. going to sort of figure it out. So, he, I mean, he definitely doesn't know what he wants. Um, but, yeah, I mean, there are stories of him, you know, well, like I think it was maybe Ben Montench was telling me about these two different tours that Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers backed him on just one year apart. 1986, it's just just sort of magical experience. They're playing all these old time rock and roll covers. They're having a blast, right? One year, not even like less than a year later, they do a follow up tour, 1987. And Ben Mont is expecting it to be more or less the same thing. But like they go in a rehearsal room and he says, Bob is just entirely uncommunicative. He's just like playing. I think he said the ballad of Frankie Lee and Judas Priest over and over, like by himself for like an hour. And they're like, <laughs> the musicians are trying to jam along. But like, you know, it's a four minute song or something like how are you? he's not doing anything. He's just playing the same damn chords. And so, you know, and. I think I think that's, you know, Dylan was feeling good in 1986 and feeling bad in 1987. Like, what is the difference between those two? It's the same person with the same exact same musicians. I mean, he is mercurial. And I think that sort of approach doesn't always lead to these amazing dividends. I don't want to claim every Dylan concert is great or every Dylan tour is great because they're not. It's wildly up and down. But, you know, for those of us who are fascinated, that's kind of what makes it interesting. I think the one of the things that your book attests to in your uh, in your Substack is that, particularly with Dylan, talking to the people that have worked with him 
is in many ways a more insightful view of his creative process itself. How his records are made or how his bands work that maybe Dylan is like the last person <laughs> you would want to interview. You know, like reading your Larry Campbell interview, for instance, I feel like I would I have a much better view of of those years that he was in the band than I would ever get from you know a like a Dylan interview, even a good Dylan interview. Do you uh do you subscribe to that point of view? Do you agree with that? And was that part of the inspiration for doing this? Yeah, I mean, I I would say not. It's not necessarily better to talk to other people, but it's very different. A Dylan interview is fascinating in a hundred million ways. Just seeing the way his mind works, seeing what he's thinking about, seeing how he phrases things. However, you're not going to get literal answers to almost everything, anything. You're certainly not going to get literal answers to like, so how did rehearsals for that last tour go? Or boy, you know, uh, what was it like getting booed every night? And you know, when he went gospel or something like that's just not. You, you don't get that sort of nuts and bolts information, whereas talking to these people in my book, most of whom are not huge names, but they will actually sort of give you the facts, the stories, the behind the scenes anecdotes, and really piece together how does he work, right? With an emphasis on work. How does he create? How do these new songs come into being? How do these new arrangements come into being? What is life like on the road? What is a, you know, he tours constantly. What is that like? You'll get more information that way than you will from Dylan himself, usually. You know, you say these aren't big names, but like if you are a Dylan fan, like talking to Alan Pasqua or something is like, is a big deal, you know, <laughs> especially someone like that who's talking about like the street legal era, which you're never going to read that. Like Rolling Stone is never going to do that story. Or actually, Andy Green might do that story. Uh, but, you know, for the most part, you're not going to be able to read something like that specific about a Dylan era. Um, so you've actually been able to talk to like a, like a really good range of people. I'm curious, like, what is your batting average with approaching musicians? Because I mean, most of the people you're talking to haven't worked with Dylan in in some time, but I would imagine that they still don't want to get on his bad side. They may harbor a hope that, they're going to get a call from Tony Garnier or Jeff Rosen, whoever makes those calls to new musicians and be invited to play with him again. So I mean, is it hard to actually get these people to talk about Dylan, just knowing how secretive Dylan is and how he seems like a guy that remembers people talking about him in the press? Uh, especially if it's a negative situation. So just talk about, I guess, your process of approaching these people and like how successful are you at getting them to talk? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's it's very difficult. I mean, that's in some ways, I mean, it's not literally the most difficult part, but it's a very difficult part because many of these people have never spoken in depth about their time with Dylan before. At first, I literally thought they were probably NDAs. Before I started interviewing people, I was like, I'm sure everyone signed something. And the first couple of people I asked, did you sign it? And no, there are no NDAs. But it's just, as you say, people know that he's private. No one wants to get on his bad side. No one wants to say anything that's going to get taken out of context or a gotcha headline or something that's going to make them look bad, look make him look bad. And so the first few were extremely difficult to get people to say yes. But the nice thing about doing it as a newsletter, you know, half of these maybe ran in the newsletter first, was that I sort of had a proof of concept. Once I got one person, I could send it to the next person and they could read it and say, okay, this guy knows his stuff. This is really in depth. It's always about the music first. There are plenty of like backstage stories, but you know, it's not just looking for, I don't know, gossip or something about his family or something. Um, and so that made it slightly easier. And what made it even easier was that one musician would recommend me to another. You know, I think, I don't know, Tench maybe was like, you got to talk to Keltner, here's his email, or, or maybe it was the other way around. But you know, that sort of thing would happen where someone would maybe be apprehensive at first and they do it and they'd feel good about it. Um, and I should say, you know, speaking of Tench, I spoke to him a year ago in depth, easily the most in-depth interview about Bob Dylan he's ever given. And then a year later, just two weeks ago, he's back on stage playing with Bob Dylan again. So I think the, uh, you know, idea that Dylan is vindictive and is going to go after anyone who says anything about him 
Uh, clearly, that's not true, at least, again, maybe depending on what you say. So like, what like, was there a particular uh, person that you got to talk that really broke the dam for you that like made it like, oh, he talked to this person. This is a good interview. And then after that, it was easier to get other people to talk. There wasn't just one, but I'm trying, I can't quite remember the order. Larry Campbell was fairly early and, you know, he's the sort of people that he's the sort of person who, while he's not a household name, musicians really respect Larry Campbell. And again, they could read it. And I spent like two hours with him and it's really in depth. And, you know, so, so that one, I remember sending to some people, Jim Keltner, I think was a little later, but again, not like every single person in the world knows his name, but if you're a musician sort of in this world, you definitely know his name. Um, so yeah, those were probably two that helped. But I mean, the thing is, I don't, I don't mean to act like it's gotten totally easy. I still get no's all the time. I got tons of no's for this book. Like, you know, it's sort of an ongoing process. And again, that's what's nice about having the newsletters. I'm still sort of plugging away and trying to turn some more of those no's into yeses. I mean, because Larry Campbell, that's like one of the more recent collaborators, right? I mean, I feel like you haven't had a lot of recent never-ending tour people. Have you? Like, no, like, yeah, he's not one of the most recent, but um, not a ton. I mean, part of it's that there's been less turnover. You say Tony is one thing, but like even Donnie Heron, who I, who's a musician who plays multi, a pedal steel and various other instruments, who I think of as like the new guy. He's been there for like going on 20 years now. Um, so yeah, some of the, you know, some of the more recent people are like, I got them in order my book, Duke Robart. I mentioned uh, Freddie Coel is a little more recent than Larry. But yeah, I, I, uh, he just, the first drummer just left the uh, Rough and Rowdy Ways tour, which is the first musician to leave. Um, so that's, uh, that's who is in my sights currently. Yeah. I love the, I love the uh, Ray Paget exit interview. Like if this is going to be a thing for Dylan musicians now, it's like, I'm out of the band. <laughs> Oh, I got the Ray Paget email. Wants to talk to me. You know, that could be a thing for Dylan now. It's like you're like the uh, HR person for the Dylan band. You can do the exit interviews from now on. I think that'd be a I hope I hope Dylan's people start putting that in the contract, actually. <laughs> um do you have any do you have any like what's your list of favorites of interviews that you've done? I've got my favorites uh, the, uh, from your book, uh, but I'm curious like what your favorites are. It's a good question. I mean, the ones that jump out to me are the ones that were really fun to do in the moment. And that is someone like Stan Lynch, who oh, was yeah. the drummer for Tom Pay and the Heartbreakers. And, I was you know, going to say, Stan Lynch is like, that might be the best. It's, it's, at least it's the most entertaining, just because it seems like Stan Lynch is like, just seems like the best hang in the world. Yes, that's correct. And again, it was so, it was so surprising just because I I'm a Tom Petty fan. I don't know the ins and outs. I didn't know what Stan Lynch was like as a person, right? Um, all of these interviews are edited. You know, what, what's the line? Condensed and edited. Um, but his, it's edited, but less than the others. Like if you, you know, when I would go back and listen to the audio recording for the transcript, it's not that different. Some of them you really have to sort of piece together because they were, you know, all over the place. Whereas he's just a great rack on tour. So he'll just launch into this story and it's, a, and, you know, it's a great story. And then you're like, hey, what about this, this show you guys played, you know, in Israel? And then they'll be like, oh, yeah. And then it turns out he has a great story about that. So, you know, people like that are the ones that I really remember fondly. I mean, there are other people in the book that like, you know, maybe they're not great storytellers and I really had to drag it out of them. And it may be one, you know, an amazing chapter or something in the end. But like the real ones that are really fun to do or where you're kind of just sitting back and letting them go a little bit. I'm a fan of the Rob Stoner interview. I think that was like my entry into your your, your blog. I feel like that was a relatively early one that you did. Yeah, that was probably even before Larry. That actually one of one might have been one of the first. But you know, Rob Stoner, just that period, you know, working uh uh the Rolling Thunder tour, and then he was on the Street Legal tour, and and he was also he was a guy that was like a little bit critical of Dylan, if if I recall correctly. Like what like, didn't he yeah. kind of talk about how he was basically trying to make the arrangements more interesting because he, he thought that they were like pretty musically simple. Am I remembering that correctly? I, yeah, I that's like, right. I mean, he's sort of pointing out the Dylan songs are, you know, mostly like three or four chords, which, right. which is true, especially at that point. And so he describes some tension. He's trying to like make them jazzier. And as I said, Bob Dylan's not literally a jazz artist. Well, you just think of like the street legal 
uh, you know, that that live at Budokan era that he was because he was the band leader for that tour, wasn't he? Was it was it Stoner? The, the first the first part of it? Yeah, right. So that's when he was really spreading his wings <laughs> in that regard in terms of just shaking up uh, the songs. It's interesting because that's another era in his career that when I was reading about Bob Dylan as a teenager, you know, live at Budokan, you know, it didn't even get one star in the Rolling Stone record guide. I feel like I got that like little black box thing or whatever, like that was like for a bomb or it was like worse than one star. And now, you know, there's a box set being released and it's something that younger Dylan fans uh love and that, and that is sort of a constant thing that's been happening with dylan uh, you know you and i i think are around the same age um like are you in your 40s 30s you're in your 30s okay so you know like gen x uh millennial age dylan fans um rediscovering these er- eras that were maligned um you know by the original audience and i feel like your book really kind of teases out some of those eras again like you've got talking to alan pasqua talking about the street legal era which is not something that again 20 years ago anyone would have cared about can you just talk about that i mean i feel like that's such a big part of uh dylan's enduring popularity that there are these segments of his career or persona or work or whatever that like younger generations can claim because they were somehow overlooked at the time that's really interesting. Um, and I, I was just actually earlier today listening to an interview, a podcast interview with Nick Thorburn, who's on who's in the band Islands. And he was talking about how, I think I asked him about the Beatles and he was kind of like, you know, the Beatles, I think he's maybe around our age. He was like, yeah, the Beatles had already been claimed. Like, I mean, I like him, I respect him, but like they weren't, they weren't my thing. And to some degree, that's true with like 60s Dylan, you know, um, it's, it, it's as great as everyone says it is, of course, but I think I do see younger fans getting into these sort of maligned eras. You know, you you can have something to sort of claim as your own. I mean, you mentioned at Budokan, which if anyone doesn't know, is this live album where there's like, you know, 30 band members and backup singers and f- copious flute solos and sax. Like it's very Dylan Goes Vegas was what it was called. But that was one of my first Dylan albums. And the only reason it was one of my first Dylan albums is because when I was starting to get into Dylan, I went to the CD store and, you know, all the CDs were whatever, 15 bucks. But this was a double album. You got two CDs for your 15 bucks. So I was like, oh, well, that, that's, you know, I'm, on, I'm I'm working with my allowance here. That's a no brainer. And so like, you know, sort of the canonical version of Don't Think Twice, It's All Right to Me is this sort of reggae pop hybrid from Matt <laughs> Budokan. Right. And it's only, you know, I, two years later when I hear this <laughs> acoustic finger picking uh, folk version. Version. So yeah, but I do th- I do think that le- that's that lets generations of people feel like like he's he's theirs that there are always these undiscovered pockets that were you know maligned at the time the Christian era being another one that you know everyone sort of hated it then Dylan goes Christian but now gets a lot of respect. Um, and I mean, have you found that like when you go back to some of these musicians who played in maybe a less herald- heralded era or a less discussed era, like are they? surprised that you want to talk about it no <laughs> i don't think i think i i, I it, it's it's just that, like it looms like and i don't mean this is negative but if you're a musician who played with dylan like that was the greatest dylan era you know what i mean all these right, people right. have such mostly good memories but even when they're bad they're like these totemic memories of you know a sort of pinnacle moment in their career um so yeah even if it was for like you know 1984 a real live tour or something like fairly you know maligned maligned era like this was this was great a record. big part of their it's a great record their... i'm a real live defender well i just there. two days ago i interviewed the bass player so that'll be coming oh, really? coming soon yeah greg sutton Got a lot oh of great God. real live era stories for you, uh, real that, live heads out there. I am in the. <laughs> wonder, I'm wondering how big the real live hive is. I don't know how <laughs> big it is, but I'll be first in line to read that interview. Um, who are your white whales? Who are the musicians that you've been chasing? Maybe they've already said no to you, but you're not taking no for an answer. Like, who are you? Uh, who's like at the top of your list? The top two or three people that you haven't been able to get yet that you really want. Well, the ultimate white whale is not someone who's going to happen anytime soon. And that would be Tony Garnier, who you mentioned he's been the bassist for Dylan's band for since 1989. And I guess the thing I haven't mentioned yet is that current 
band members don't talk. They don't talk to me. They don't talk to anyone. It's just one of those things. So I don't even really try. I haven't even put out an interview request to Tony because he hasn't done an interview <laughs> pretty much since he joined Bob Dylan's band 30 plus years ago. Um, but in terms of at least within the realm of, so anyway, one day I'd like to talk to him, uh, at least within the realm of possibility, they're not, I mean, they're like the big name or, you know, the relatively big names that I would have loved to get talked to, uh, G.E. Smith. You know, I, I hope to oh. talk to him one of these days. Obviously, he's great. He's someone who has done some interviews. But the ones, you know, they're sometimes more obscure, just like people I'm a huge fan of and just sort of fascinated by. Like there was this drummer named George Rosselli, um, mm. who is not a big name on his own. He's not like, oh, he was on the Rolling Thunder tour. He's a guy who drummed for Dylan for many years basically in the early 2000s for like for like 12 or 13 years or something. But that includes most of the shows I saw, you know, because I got into Dylan in the 2000s. And I think he's just fascinating. Again, he's someone who's never done an interview. Um, again, he's someone who has not yet agreed to do an interview with me. But those sorts of people, I'm just I would just love to talk to. And yeah, I guess it is. I'm sort of coming up with this as I'm saying it. But to some degree, the people who've never spoken before, like George Rosselli, like, you know, other people, those are the ones I'm fascinated by. I mean, some of the people I have in this book have spoken. Again, Rob Stoner, you mentioned, he's someone who has done interviews. I'd like to think I got some new stuff out of him, but like, he's not a wallflower. He's 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 been out there. But to me, the really special ones are the ones where like, I kind of go in not really knowing what they're going to say, because for all my research, they've never really talked much about their time with Bob Dylan. And those are the ones that really stand out to me. This guy is currently in his band, but Charlie Sexton would be another one that would be amazing to get. He's playing with, you know, well, actually he's not in the band right now. So like you could get Sexton. Yeah, I'd love to try to get to get Sexton. You know, when I was doing the book, a lot of it was or some of it was before the, you know, it was like pandemic. Right. So we didn't know if Charlie Sexton was in the band because he was in the band um, up until fairly recently. But yeah, he's not anymore. Again, someone who's he, he is sort of is a name, but he hasn't really done any in-depth interviews about Dylan. Um, but um, I'm trying. Yeah, the the. Uh, exit interview for doing HR. You got to get Charlie Sexton. Um, yeah. I'm wondering, have you heard from Dylan Camp at all? Even just rumblings from Dylan Camp. Do you have any sense it, that they're aware? I mean, I'm sure they're aware of what, you, of what you're doing, but how they feel about it? Are they upset about it? Any any uh, any feeling about that? Yeah, uh, they are. I was. I'll preface this by saying I was worried they were going to be upset. Not worried as in I'm trying to please Dylan Camp. You know, if someone says something interesting about Bob that's negative, I'm, I'll print it. Um, but I, I wouldn't want the word to go out, you know, to the the list serve of all former band members. Don't talk to this guy. But no, I they've been supportive is maybe too strong a word. This isn't an official or authorized book by any stretch, but, you know, I've been in touch with Jeff Rosen, who's his manager briefly. He approved some photos I wanted to use for the book. And he said, yeah, you know, send me a copy. Um, so yeah, they, I mean, they're sort of, again, it's, it, it sort of goes against the secret and private and they don't want anything released. Um, and if it's about Bob's kids or something, that probably is true. But in terms of what I'm doing, that's about the music and the performance, there's been no resistance. And even in the extremely limited capacity I've asked for assistance, they've helped. Yeah, he is secretive, but at the same time, he's very out there and constantly you know, putting out box sets and books and albums. You know, there's tons of Dylan stuff out there. So hes it's not like he's averse to, uh, you know, people talking about his music. Would you want to interview Bob Dylan? Is that something you're interested in? Or do you think it would be a nightmare? I've asked myself this question. <laughs> I'm curious, like, how you feel about it. If Jeff Rosen, I mean, obviously you would say yes if Jeff Rosen was like, hey, Bob wants to talk to you. You would obviously would do it. But is that something you would want to happen? Or would you dread that happening? I mean, why pick one, right? Of course I would dread it. Uh, it would be, I, you know, I wouldn't survive because I'd have a panic attack beforehand, partly because it's just intimidating, but partly again, because the sort of interview I do is not the sort of interview Bob Dylan does, right? I would be going in like, so when you, you didn't play Idiot Wind for 30 years, and then in 1992, you start playing Idiot Wind again, like, why did you decide to do that? And that's like, not, uh, that's not the sort of question he, <laughs> he, he answers, um, 
you know, he he wants to sort of expound philosophical, which is great, but which is sort of not my MO. So, I mean, my sort of to the extent I've ever even thought about it, my like dream Dylan interview would be something so esoteric and niche where like we do an hour long interview and we're only going to talk about his 1995 tour, like something like that. That That's well, what like, I would want to do. Something just ridiculous. Like we're not going to talk about songwriting at all. Not going to talk right. about lyrics at all. Just going to pick some very small and ideally unpopular <laughs> or niche topic and just talk about that. That would be the sort of Dylan interview I'd be excited to do. See, I would want to interview him because I think he would actually be into this about something that had nothing to do with his own music, but about maybe somebody else's music or about like film noir. Like I'd want to talk to him. I'm like, Bob, let's break down 1970s Jimmy Buffett albums. Cause I know you like <laughs> Jimmy Buffett and I'm not really a Jimmy Buffett fan, but explain to me like the brilliance of son of a son of a sailor. And then I want to hear Bob Dylan talking about son of a son of a sailor. I think that would be fascinating on multiple levels and I think he'd be more excited about that. That would be my dream, Bob Dylan interview. All right. Well, now now you've given me an idea. So you remember how maybe a decade ago, Peter Gabriel did two albums. One, he covered a bunch of artist songs. And then there was a companion art album where those same artists covered Peter Gabriel songs, right? So maybe there was a companion book where I interview Bob Dylan all about these exact same musicians. I just go, so <laughs> Bob, let's talk about Larry Campbell for half an hour. And then let's talk about Jim Keltner. That could be, that, that could be, be like amazing. the, yeah, the partner book. Maybe and that's I bet what I should interview him about. I bet he'd be super insightful about that much more than if you asked him about, you know, John Wesley Harding or something. Yeah. I think be great. Um, are we ready to do a Q&A Q now? I think we've hit the fourth, we've hit the. Yeah. Yeah. I think we can, we can start asking some questions. Hopefully some more folks will uh, put some questions there in the chat, uh, but I can begin. Um, so my, I just have a lot of sort of methodology process questions is because that's what I'm really always interested in. And we have process mm -hmm. in our game here. Um, so I'm just curious about your approach to these interviews. I know you were doing them, uh, I think before the book, but what was your approach in terms of, um, you know, did you have some, some sort of formalized list of questions that you knew you wanted to ask every single person, regardless of, you know, what their context was with tweaks and follow-ups or was everything just individually tailored? Um, and then I have a, a second question that I can just wait and ask later, depending on if more questions come up. It was pretty individually tailored. I mean, there would be one or two exceptions. I'm sure I asked everyone, so how did you meet Bob Dylan? You know, that's, you kind of got to hit that. Um, but beyond that, it was really doing a lot of research into not just them personally, but also just what Bob Dylan was doing in the time he was playing with them. For instance, you know, a lot of these people toured with Dylan. So in every case, I would go through Bob Dylan's tour dates from their window. And I would say, what are some from the outside, notable shows like Larry Campbell. I'd look through, he was eight years. We can't talk about every show he did in eight years, but I'd scan through, oh, the time Bob Dylan played for the Pope. We got to talk about that. They played at the Grammys twice. One time, a crazy stage crasher. We got to talk about that. Um, and that I found very helpful because not everyone is Stan Lynch. A lot of the people will, I noticed, we could get 10 minutes of sort of platitudes is is the wrong word i don't not i don't mean to be critical but generalities oh it was so meaningful i as a kid had listened to you know but you can only get so much of that and then i'd have to constantly sort of be bringing up very specific things what about this what about that what about that and have enough of them where half of them they'd say i don't remember oh yeah that was nice <laughs> you know but if you have a lot that's how you get to the the good stories and you know it was always very gratifying where someone would sort of pause and I don't know if, uh, oh, yeah. And then they'd like think of something they hadn't thought of um, in, in decades, because in many cases, you know, some cases I'm talking about the 60s, that's 60 years ago, even the 90s is 30 years ago, crazy as that is. So, so yeah, that in terms of the questions, I guess would be my answer. Okay, thank you. Um, Bill Alderson, did you want to unmute and ask your question? Sure. I was just wondering if you uh, reached out to Bob Newitt before he passed, because I thought he would be 
just an amazing interview and lots of uh, great stories. No, I wish I, I wish I had. Um, I don't remember the exact chronology, but he passed right around the time I was starting to do this. Um, there are a couple in that camp. There's this other guy who's playing I love named Bucky Baxter, who was on pedal steel for much of the 90s. He passed sort of right as I was starting to do this. I mean, I've said and thought to myself, it's too bad I didn't do this 30 years ago. You know, there's to some degree a race against time. Um, you know, Robbie Robertson, obviously, we just lost a couple of weeks ago. Um, you know, if I'd been doing this in the 70s, all these people would still be around. So I would have loved to talk to North. I talked to a lot of Rolling Thunder people, but I he passed either before I started or like right around the same time. Hey, I'm going to defer to Carl here. Do you want to ask a question and I'll come back around? Yeah. Um, so I have a couple. The first one is sort of a... a cluster of related questions about the, and this is stuff that, you know, real heads probably know, but I don't. Um, what's the relationship between the membership of the touring bands and who's typically brought into the studio for albums in recent decades? And have you talked to people who were just studio musicians and how, about how the arrangements and the approach to working songs up and that kind of thing differ in that environment? Sure. Uh, so the first part is it has varied widely. In recent years, they've been the same people. He's whoever is in his band on the road when it's album time, he drags him into the studio. But other times it's been totally different. Like G.E. Smith, who is one of the most prominent guitarists Dylan has played with and played with him for a number of years, never was on an album because Bob Dylan recorded albums during G.E. Smith's tenure and he just brought totally different people in. Um, and yeah, I've talked to plenty of people. I mean, my I've talked to plenty of people who've, in the, who've been in the studio with Dylan. Um, I don't know if anyone, I, so because my newsletter focuses on live, I think they all have some connection to live, but someone like Jim Keltner, he only toured with Dylan for a couple of years, but he's been on knocking on heaven's door. And then in the eighties, he's on that and he's on, you know, all these studio things. So of course, if I'm talking to Jim Keltner, I'm not going to just be like, I don't want to hear, I don't want to hear knocking on heaven's door stories. We just got to talk about, you know, the, these sets of tour dates. I don't, so, you know, I don't want to hear about you recording with the traveling Wilburys for God's sakes, because you guys didn't tour. So forget that. Um, no, I, I sort of get a lot of studio stuff in that way. And to the other part of your question, what's interesting is it doesn't vary. It's not that different. Like you'll get in the room and in this case, it's a lot like rehearsal The you know, there's mics, <laughs> there's an engineer and a big soundboard, but he's still sort of jamming and playing it out and not giving you any instructions. And you got to sort of figure it out what to do. And they'll just be recording the whole time. And, you know, after one or two times, they decide that's the take and he moves on. It's sort of amazing how similar it is in terms to, to how he rehearses or performs live. Very spontaneous, very unrehearsed and very quick. Okay. Thank you. Um, so I'm just going to ask my other process question. I'm just curious about, and this also ties into Carl's second question or third question, um, project design, you know, so the Substack, you were doing interviews for that. And then I'm just curious in terms of the book, how you were thinking about designing the interviews. I mean, you know, how did you make decisions about how you would use them? You know, Q&A versus more of your commentary or or both and how you would edit them. I'm just curious, like, how you thought about the book versus what you were already doing. Yeah, so the book sort of came about because of the Substack. When I started the Substack, it was like, well, you know, one of these sort of pandemic projects, right? I started it in early 2020. Turns out I had a lot of free time. Um, and I eventually started doing interviews after I had done, I don't know, 10, 12, 15, maybe for the Substack. I started to think there's maybe a book here. And then in terms of the process, I started splitting the interviews in half for a couple of years. Half of them I published in the Substack, half of them I quietly secreted away in my little book interview folder. Just you know, so it's not all retreads of people who've been subscribing since day one to stuff they've already read. And then you mentioned Q and A's in terms of the formatting, both and this is both the Substack and the book. I I've run I run them all in Q and A format, and the reason I do that is, as I said, many of these people have never spoken 
at any length about their time with Dylan. So as much as I can be sort of a facilitator almost to help them tell the stories in their own words, again, I mean, and I know a lot of people on here know how this works. It's not literally a raw transcript. Obviously I've gone through, I've edited, I've done various things, but I am trying to have it in their voice, them telling the stories as much as possible. I edit my questions out. I mean, there's still questions in there, but like, you know, a lot of the times you read and someone tells a great story that's three paragraphs long and you don't see me being like, what year was that? And then what happened? And so was that before or after you did this, right? Because if you actually read the raw transcripts, there's a lot of that. I edit, I edit that out just because I do want, you know, to sort of not have me, no one needs me paraphrasing these stories. Why not? Why not hear them from the people themselves? All right. Thank you. Um, so, Carl, I don't know if you wanted to jump back in and then and then Lauren after that. Yeah, just because you were talking about the um, Substack element of it, I'll follow up. I'm curious, like what, you know, and this is sort of more of a uh, publishing business question, like what, you know, developing a project that way, what kinds of conversations did you have with your publisher about that method of cultivating an audience for the book, but also about how to, and you touched on this, but I'd like to hear more about how to make sure the book feels fresh. Um, and the idea of continuing the Substack once the book is out, like all of the questions of sort of strategy around that in publishing, I'd be interested in hearing a little bit about. Well, one correction, which actually ties right into the Substack thing. And that correction is the publisher is me. I, my previous two books were on, you know, major publishers, the sort of traditional way, but the Substack model, you know, where you have this sort of direct connection to readers, they're, I mean, they're paying you, you know, subscriptions. Um, I found that so inspiring. I found this sort of community of fellow Dylan nerds. And when it came time to do this book, you know, I just thought I've, I've got, you know, a, a big part of what my first two publishers did was marketing, right? But that's publishers are really useful for that, helping to get the word out. Um, but I was, I sort of thought to myself, the best place to market this book, if a publisher was working on this book, would be in the newsletter that I happen to run. That's the most targeted, specific. This is the core audience for this book. So, so yeah. So I ended up doing it myself. Um, I mean, I didn't do it all alone. Again, I've layout guys, I'd editors, I'd, I'd various people, but they're people I hired. Um, be and it, because of that sort of Substack model that that I found so inspiring. Great. Um, so Lauren, do you want to unmute and ask your question? Sure. Thank you. Congrats on the book, Ray. Um, I had to step away from the conversation for a few minutes. So if you've covered this, we can just move on. But I'm curious if you've interviewed any of the incredible singers that have toured with Dylan. Um, over the decades uh, in in the book? Uh, I have, we didn't cover it. And yes, I have. Um, I spoke to a number of them. Ronnie Blakely, who we mentioned Rolling Thunder earlier. She is actually so interesting. She was in on the Rolling Thunder tour after Nashville had come out and as she was being nominated for an Academy Award. So she actually left the tour because she had to you know go to the Oscar ceremony and, and do the Oscar campaign. Um, and then he toured with a number of for a lot of the 80s, he started with this sort of gospel thing when he went Christian. He had these sort of amazing backing singers. And then that continued for the 80s. So I've spoke I spoke to a couple of them as well. Um, and you know, an interesting thing, this isn't exactly your question, but it brings up something that I was very conscious of. And I think is maybe a criticism of Bob Dylan, is definitely a criticism of Bob Dylan. All these people I've mentioned, these singers, they're all female, right? Those are practically the only female musicians Bob Dylan's ever worked with. You look at like the ratio of his uh, band members and it is like outrageous, overwhelmingly male and white too, but especially male. Um, so, I mean, to that, I I especially tried to interview them just to try to get different voices, but <laughs> it, there's, there, there's not a lot of them. I actually just interviewed a couple of weeks ago, a woman named Peggy Blue, who sang with Dylan and the Heartbreakers, not not for long, but some like far, the first farm maid and stuff. And yeah, you get these amazing, like, you know, she was someone who came from the church and wasn't like a super knowledgeable Bob Dylan fan, like just coming from a totally different world. And you get a different pers perspective than you get with like, you know, a studio guy who's been studying the records and, you know, playing sessions since 1971. 
Yeah, I mean the 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 singers who started in gospel who were on his tours from '78 forward, incredible mm-hmm. musicians. So I'm I'm glad to hear that their voices are are in that mix. Yeah, Reg- Regina McCrary is the one. I, she's in the book and she's the only singer who was the entire gospel thing. And again, from the church, her dad was a, a fairly prominent preacher. And so she learned singing there. And again, also not a, she's like, I, I she, she told me, you no, know, I knew blowing in the wind and maybe, maybe Jimi Hendrix's song all in the watchtower or something, but you know, but, she, but and, and she talked about how Dylan would lean on her for sort of the church thing. Like she would lead, you know, he, he was Christian. He had sort of become born again. She would be leading prayers backstage. She would open all the shows solo telling this sort of basically doing a, a preacher role before leading into the singing. Um, and so it was interesting hearing her talk about how sort of in a way, even though it's a Bob Dylan tour, the music they were making was something she had a lot more experience with than he did and hearing about how he, he sort of leaned on her for that. Yeah, for sure. You know, as great as the um, Dylan Christian period box set is it does not include any of the solo the opening um performances that was just singers which opened all the shows it's mm-hmm. kind of been written from history so yeah it's it's a it's a real shame ditto the rolling thunder box set which rolling thunder had joan joan baez does a set and joni mitchell does a set and bob newarth and robs like the, you know it's four hours of music and they they cut out all the ones that were bob dylan's not singing which commercially, sure, but it does, as you say, sort of erase from history really what the shows would have been like, which is unfortunate. Okay. Uh, Simon Barry, would you like to unmute and ask your question? Thanks very much. Uh, Hi, Ray. Hi, Stephen. Thanks very much for doing this. Um, The book is great. I fully agree with the Stan Lynch references being among the the highlights um but just wondering if there's any other story uh from any of the people that you interviewed that maybe didn't make the final cut of the book that you'd be willing to share with us this evening i certainly hope all the worthwhile stories made the final cut i don't remember <laughs> I, I i don't remember you know I, I i tried to cut the bad parts not the good part um yeah i don't i don't really have any there were a couple i mean interestingly there were one or two times where someone went off the record and told me a story but a the interesting parts is it didn't happen that often and b every time as other journalists i'm sure know everyone's every time anyone says i want to go off the record now you're like um like this is going to be where it gets good but they often sort of which i got a kick out of weren't that good they were like the part that maybe it involved maybe they were criticizing another musician who wasn't bob dylan and so they didn't want you know um but yeah, so I'm I'm sorry to sort of dodge your question, but I do hope <laughs> Ho- hopefully all the good stories did make the book. The the part I the parts I cut were hopefully the non <laughs> the non good ones. The uh, I don't remember or uh, I have no idea. Thanks, Ray. Cheers. Okay, um, I have another question here. Um, this is from Catherine. So the question is, could Ray offer a kind of test case of a particular song and talk about how it transformed from one tour to another and what musicians said about reapproaching it in those different contexts? That's a good question. Um, Yeah, so, okay, here's one. Um, Girl from the North Country. There, it's a song Dylan has played a lot in various forms um but when i talked to larry campbell who was dylan's guitarist for again about seven years in the late 90s and early 2000s it is a song that they played a lot i asked him you know i sort of play guitar just at an an amateur play at home level but there was this amazing site if you're a guitarist who is a dylan fan called dylan chords and it goes way beyond like just what's on the album he tabs out different arrangements and stuff I've spent hours, days, weeks of my life on that side. So that I, when I was like learning guitar in high school, maybe I learned this finger picked part of Girl from the North Country that Larry Campbell had done in 2004, which is when I got into Dylan. So I was very familiar with it. And it was, I, I so I literally asked him about it because this is a song that he played the previous year without that finger picking part. They played the next year without that finger picking part. So I said, you know, to use this as a test case, how did you 
the song you all knew how to play. You've been playing it with Dylan for like five years at this point. How does it suddenly get this amazing part that you're doing every night when two months before it didn't have this part? And he just talked about, again, this sort of extensive rehearsals. And what was interesting to me is that it's not that he just rehearses the new band. And then once that band knows what they're doing, they stop rehearsal before every tour. There are fairly extensive rehearsals, including if it's the same people who were on the tour two months ago. Right. And so he was like, you know, one time we're doing a rehearsal and he, Dylan is sort of strumming girl from the North country. And he's maybe strumming it in a different way than we'd been playing it on tour. And again, as usual, no, there's no instruction. He's just sort of strumming it. And Larry starts playing around with this finger picking part. And all of a sudden it just, you know, they noodle around well, like half an hour. And by the end of it, this amazing finger picking part has emerged, um, you know, and there are a lot of stories like that where it's something to come out of rehearsal. But of course, the other interesting with the interesting thing with Dylan is there are plenty of times where that comes out on stage in front of a live audience. You know, one of the musicians, I think Stan Lynch again, actually was telling me that one time during a show, Dylan turned to him and said, Hey, Stan, what song do you want to play? And Stan kind of goes, uh, and then he says, lay lady lay, which is a song that the band had never played before, but you know, Stan knew it from growing up or whatever. And so Dylan starts playing it, but he's pl playing it fast and loud. And it sounds absolutely nothing like the <laughs> slow, beautiful Lay Lady Lay. And they just sort of all wing it on stage in front of like 10,000 people. And now that's the Heartbreakers arrangement of Lay Lady Lay, which is, you know, what might happen in a rehearsal. But Dylan is not opposed to doing that live on stage in front of thousands of people, which, again, makes him somewhat unique in his cohort. All right. Well, I have one more question for you. Uh, I'm just curious if you had anything that just, I mean, obviously you're really knowledgeable about Dylan and, um, but was there anything that anyone said to you that was just an eye opener, just really surprised you, something you weren't expecting? I mean, there were a million. One line that comes to mind that sort of encapsulates a lot of this book because like, er, you know, er, early on, we were talking, Steve asked me, you know, about some threads that tied together. And there are some, I think the one I mentioned, then there's jazz, but there's also more than their threads. There are like wild differences and shifts. And one person will be like, he was the nicest guy. And we hung up backstage all the time. And I have a hundred fun, funny music anecdotes of us hanging out. And then the next guy years later is like, yeah, I never spoke to him except for on stage, <laughs> you know, and then the next year it'll go back. But so rambling Jack Elliott, you know, who's one of the, earliest guys I spoke to. He was from the Greenwich Village scene. Um, he had a good line that I'm going to have to paraphrase, but basically he was sort of musing about like who Bob Dylan is. And he's like, and this, I this, if anyone doesn't know, Ramblin' Jack Elliott and Dylan spent years together. They know each other very well. This is someone who like knew Dylan for, you know, 20 years. Um, he, but he, but he sort of says, just thinking almost out loud, he's kind of like, who is Bob Dylan? Do I know the real Bob Dylan? Does Bob Dylan know the real Bob Dylan? Every day there's a different Bob Dylan. And it's. It, I thought it was, I mean, a good line on his face, but also really encapsulates a lot of the themes of this book and why this book is not just the same sort of story over and over again, you know, because every day there's a different Bob Dylan. Um and so, yeah, it's not, it's not that it's not that the sentiment shocked me, but I just I was sort of surprised hearing it how well that really I hadn't put I hadn't, I hadn't put it together, but when he said that, I was like, "Oh, that kind of is like a thesis statement almost <laughs> for, all, for putting all these together." Great. Well, thank you. Hey, this was a really wonderful conversation. I want to thank Ray and Stephen. Um, please join us next week when Carol Vernalis and Stephen Shaviro will be here to talk about their respective books, "The Media Swirl" and "The Rhythm Image," which will consider new and varied ways to think about music videos. And we hope to see you next week. Good night, everyone. <laughs>